Okay, so welcome back everybody. This last session. The first speaker of this session is Professor Ragamasha from the University. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much for uh, the organizer for this very kind invitation and to all of you for being here. And uh, I would like to present uh, some uh, uh, results, which are some joint work with Thierry Goudon of the RIA and University of uh, Côte d'Azur, Nice, France, and uh, Pauline Lafitte of the Central Superlec uh, Paris, uh, France. Okay, and this is uh, some results uh, concerning a fluid particle model, and which I want to show in a second. Uh, okay, now it will arrive, I think. Yes, okay. So, uh, this is the outline of the talk. So, it's divided more or less in two parts. The first part is that it's a part in which I would like to present uh, uh, some possible uh, model for uh, this kind of uh, mixture. mixture. Uh, so-called particle latent flow, and these are inside this kind of modeling. I will give more details. There are two kinds of different models. One is uh, this is called with Burgers, uh, and the other one with Doyler because they have somewhat they give rise to uh, different type of models. Uh, and in this kind of way, we'll see the details in. After that, I'm going to discuss something about uh, which are the kind of uh, regularizing term that we are going to obtain for this kind of model. Obtaining essentially this uh, uh, adding the, the diffusive uh, term. And uh, uh, to conclude the first part, there is a discussion with the fact that both models, so the uh, burger stocker punk model and the lawyer stocker punk model, Possess some entropy which gives rise to some stable essential uh, models. Then, in the second part, I will concentrate on shock profiles. So, there is a third part, a very brief part, in which I will discuss, I will recall what a shock profile is, it is a very standard thing. And there is a, a less standard, but it's classical a criterion for um, having an entropic um, profile, which is called the Lewis entropy criterion. And then there are these two kind of uh, uh, of kind of uh, profiles. So the profile with the small amplitude limit and the one with the large amplitude. And uh, to conclude, uh, I will give some a bit uh, of details if I will have time about the case in which the temperature which appears in the model is zero or uh, it is small. So let me start with the first part uh, that is. Uh, uh, the model in front, so which I'm going to present this two type of representation description. Okay, uh, so what is this particle latent flow? Actually, it's a, it's a particle latent flow is a, a, a mixture mixture of two uh, kind of two types of uh, phases. One is uh, called the carrier, which correspond to a continuous phase. And then there is a second part, uh, which is called the dispersed phase or particle phase. So essentially, the continuous phase is composed by some sort of connected medium, where the dispersed phase, uh, which is composed by small diluted particles, move. Uh, so some example is that you may imagine that the carrier part here, uh, like the air, for example, with some particles that are distributed inside this large medium, which is uh, composed by a sort of uh, fine aerosol particles. So the aerosol particles are the dispersed phase and the air is the carrier phase. Then there are many more applications, of course. Uh, so you can imagine that we can try to describe uh, some pollution dispersion uh, in the atmosphere or some other things that I here. So the, the picture is more or less something like that. So there is a, a continuous carrier part, which is a, the diffused part, and then a dispersed 
part which is localized into the uh, into the into the carrier phase. We are going to concentrate on the case of one dimensional space domain, but the modeling more or less can be proposed also for uh, multi interdimensional case. Actually, the main point in which one dimensional case is relevant is the fact that we are going to concentrate then on the shock profiles and these are typically uh, structured with a planar um, symmetry, so it's typically one dimension. So the kind of model that I propose, that we propose, and actually this has been proposed in the paper by um, Thierry Boudon, Jose Carrillo, and then they worked also more on that in the beginning, Boudon, Carrillo, and Pauline Lafitte. It, it is based on this kind of representation. So there are these two different types of uh, phases, the dispersed phase, the dispersed phase, and the carrier phase. Uh, the, Part of the disturbed phase is described actually in the sort of some sort of mesoscopic scale with the kinetic equation. So there is a part, the, the kinetic uh, the particle distribution is described by this function f epsilon, which is simply transport with speed p. And then there is a coupling term here, L u f epsilon. Uh, of course, uh, I have to say something here about the, the which is in any case uh, already being presented in some other case. So the rho epsilon is the density for the dispersed phase. So it's the integral in the velocity of the uh, particle distribution. And the first momentum is denoted here by the letter with the capital J epsilon. This is the first momentum. So here there is, a, on the left hand side, there is a part that is just the pure transport term. In the equation, and then there is a coupling term that appears here in this term, uh, and this is the specific expression for the coupling. This is composed by the sum of two terms. Uh, let's discuss before uh, the second part. This is more or less a, a, an attempt of inserting in the model some sort of uh, small fluctuation into the into the model. Actually, smallness depends really on the parameter theta. So then we are going to observe to concentrate to focus on the case where theta is small, so that the where the fluctuation are, are negligible, but here in principle it could be also thought as a large parameter. Uh, and this is just relative to the standard kinetic part. And then there is a coupling term. So here there is the V is the uh, unknown for the uh, is the speed of propagation for the uh, function f and u is related to the u of the carrying phase. So this is the coupling term, it appears at the level of this first term. Here essentially the idea is that uh, the, the velocity v of the particles is trying to uh, converge essentially to the same speed of the, uh, of the carrying phase. So, but the coupling is at, uh, in the term. Of course, then I have to tell you something about u. So u is related to the carrying phase, and actually is the speed for the carrying phase. So um, the second part is the, the description of the carrying phase, which is considered essentially as a fluid. So here there is the standard conservation of momentum for the fluid phase which is the time derivative of n epsilon u epsilon plus some term which has the standard uh, term n u squared plus some pressure term, which I have to give some details on the structure. And here is the part where the coupling appears. So uh, in the time scale of order epsilon, there is this uh, idea that the momentum for the fluid equation we like to go Toward the momentum of the um, of the carrying phase. So these are the two coupling terms are here and here. Essentially. Of course, here there is something missing because this can be considered as an equation for u, for example, which appears also here, or n u if you want, but then I need some information relative to n epsilon. So this will give some. Uh, is as to be given. So I have to prescribe some law uh, with respect to the, uh, the variable n. 
And this is what I'm going to do in the next uh, slide. And it's exactly the point in which the two kinds of modeling appears. So the first one is Burger's pocket plank, and the second one is Euler's pocket plank. So there is the need of this additional equation for the variable M epsilon. So uh, let me consider the first case. The first case is just uh, here is uh, just this Burger's pocket plank. This will be uh, quoted later on uh, just with the acronym BFP. And here in this uh, point of view, I'm imagining the carrier as a sort of incompressible fluid in the sense that I'm just stating, I'm just stating that the density for the fluid is constant, is everywhere the same. And it can be considered normalized at one. Let me stress uh, incidentally that incompressible in this context here is not related with the standard incompressible navis equation, so there are two different kinds of modelization uh, or modeling. Uh, so it's really just the idea that you add to the uh, equation for uh, for uh, the previous equation, the one for n u, uh, just the, the fact that n is constant everywhere. And this gives rise to a, a simplified model, so Burger's BFT. Uh, then the second, the second type of modeling is more complete in some sense. It's called euler focke planck model because the idea is that there is a, a real uh, transport equation also for the quantity n. Uh, and this is just with, with this type of, uh, with a standard uh, transport equation for the quantity n. So n transport with speed u, and this is the standard conservation of mass for the fluid. Of course, uh, this is relative to the fact that in the previous uh, uh, equation, there is the appearance of the pressure term. Now, the pressure term in the case where uh, n is fixed, is constant, so it's one, let's say, does not, uh, it's just a constant that you are adding, and then this will disappear from the equation since you are differentiating with respect to time, to space. Uh, so in that case, in that situation, there is no need for giving more information on the pressure. But for this model EFP, some hypothesis on the pressure has to be uh, are required. And here I'm considering a standard case of hypothesis on the pressure, which is the pressure is strictly increasing, is convex, and then there is some. Uh, uh, coercivity at infinity. So, in the sense that Pn uh, diverge faster than n as n tend, tends to do plus infinity. A classical example is the one in which the pressure is given by the gamma. Law. So, it's some constant multiplied by n to the power gamma, so some power gamma greater than, strictly greater than, than one. So, these are the two models. Maybe I can say something direct here. So essentially, I want to propose if now I be back in, will be back in, in a second. Uh, in any case, I want to, to analyze these two kinds of models to try to consider some approximation, some sort of hydrodynamical limit of these two models. And then I would like to compare the two and try to see. Which properties is satisfied from one, and which we find is satisfied by the other, and try to compare to essentially try to establish or propose which one of the two is more is well better suited the best to idea of the of idea of modeling this kind of. Uh, okay, so let me say uh, some words about the flowing regime. So the idea is that I want to study this. Uh, Singular limit epsilon that tends to zero, with the idea that epsilon is a mean free path. And so the idea that epsilon goes to zero corresponds to the fact that the size, uh, the distance of the particles, uh, uh, the, the free path of the particles is small, it's very small, and in principle tends to zero. So um, we, uh, we propose, I said, this uh, kind of definition. This is 
that is standard. So this is what is called the Maxwellian form for the kinetic equation. So it's just one over square root of two pi theta, the exponential of this object. Of course, this depends on d, of course, which is here, and also on u. If you change u, then it changes, it changes the, the structure. Then from this relation, you can easily uh, compute the integral over r. I say that this, this is one dimensional, and uh, which is one. Then I take the limit, the formal limit is epsilon goes to zero. So this means that formally this term will tend to zero. So L u f will tend to, to zero. And this essentially, for at least formally, gives the asymptotic representation for f epsilon in terms of some density, which is in fact the density of the particles and the Maxwellian that is written up here. <clears throat> Just because essentially you see when you plug uh, this term inside the LU is is uh, is equal to zero, and uh, then there is this other term that I have to consider. So this was just the integral of rho, so it is written like that. It's rho mu, and um, no, it, it was rho. There is an integral of, of f epsilon, but this. Is, the, the, limit, the formal limit of, uh, of f epsilon. And then with this uh, assumption, with this uh, relation here, then one can see that the uh, limit uh, as epsilon goes to zero of the g epsilon of the flux is in fact the flux for the um, limiting definition. And uh, the second moment of the kinetic part is, uh, it has this representation. So uh, one it's after some computation, one can see that this can this in fact is gives uh, that this uh, the sum of these two terms. One is uh, the level which is a mixed term actually with the, the density of the particles and the speed of the fluid, and then there is some sort of additional pressure term that comes from the fact that there are some particles in the area. When you plug uh, this uh, uh, equation. Into the into the model, you obtain one of the effect uh, in, a, in, a, in a entity for uh, this called these things, this object that is the sum of the uh, density of the fluid and the carrier and the density of the carrier, so it's n plus rho. So there is an equation for this thing, this object that we call hybrid density, which has this form. So it's the time derivative of LU plus uh, the space derivative of LU squared plus PN, exactly, plus theta rho uh, equal to, to zero. So and now I collect this together with the previous equation. I got something which, is, uh, which I'm going to present in the next uh, slide. So with this uh, uh, procedure, I obtain these two different modeling. The first one is the one that is, as I told you, this Burger Spocker Planck. It, has, it is a, both they have the structure of a hyperbolic first order system where W, the unknown in the first model, is composed by just two components, R and RU here, or rho and uh, one plus rho U. But in any case, let me consider this object R. Uh, just to have something that is similar to the, the object that I'm going to describe in the second part. So this is RLU, which is in fact is uh, uh, n plus rho, so one, which is n bar plus rho, and then this is one n bar plus rho times. And the equation for this system, so the first case, the first case of Burgers, uh, is just like that. So it's uh, uh, it has this structure, which is very simple, and uh, uh, okay, and uh, here uh, let me stress probably that uh, apart the, the main part, which are the standard part for uh, Euler equation, also there is uh, the pressure term here, which in fact take into account simply the pressure due to the fact that there are some particles inside the fluid. Remember that this row here will be always uh, 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 R minus uh, one. So this is a, a linear term in the pressure. 
So this is the first model. Then there is the second modeling, which is the equation for uh, um, the third equation, which I dragged in the previous slide, appears, uh, which is composed by adding also the equation for the variable n. So the first two equations are standard. This is a standard transport equation for both the, um, the carrier phase and the mixed and the hybrid density, which means, of course, that there is an analogous relation row in case of n uh, in the first equation. And then there is this uh, other equation that I wrote in the previous slide. So there is this equation that I have obtained for the variable f, or not, sorry, for the moment l, which is uh, which gives rise to a closed system. So you see that I'm known here as N R R U as it's written here. And, uh, and this box is N U R U R U squared plus P N plus R. Now I have this two system. This is the case, the limiting case, the case in which formal essentially epsilon is set equal to zero. And both systems can be proved that under the natural assumption on P and uh, also on temperature, they are both strictly hyperbolic. Here is written again. The idea is to try to compare these two uh, modeling, these two type of models, to try to see which one is better uh, suited for uh, the modeling approach. It's true that I'm not really comparing these two systems, but I'm also considering taking into account some uh, term that appears when I go back to the original kinetic formulation and keep also the term of order epsilon. <laughs> And this is what I will do in, uh, in a minute. So the idea is that I want to try to understand what's going to happen for positive epsilon, but small. And so the natural thing is to apply this very standard object, which is called the Chapman, Chapman s code expansion, to obtain first order correction in x. So there are some computations that has to be employed and here there are no details uh, for, for your convenience. And uh, which essentially implies that I consider F start from this point in this assumption, I take F epsilon as essentially the limiting term rho and u plus some perturbation. Of course, this term for epsilon equal to zero is zero. So it remains just the formal limit F equal rho n. Uh, but for positive epsilon, there is some perturbation. And the point is that since uh, uh, when I integrate on the left hand side, I got rho here. Uh, this is the, I got rho here when I integrate with respect to the velocity. And here I get the rho times the integral of m of u that we said that is one. So it's just rho equal to rho. And then the integral of g epsilon has to be zero. Because so when I plug this kind of uh, answers essentially into the uh, kinetic part, I obtain some sort of expansion in epsilon, and I try to figure out which is the form for the first order correction in epsilon. Here, imagine that the, the, essentially the, the idea, the basic idea is that I will have some sort of series in terms of epsilon. So if I want to, a description, an extra description, more or less, for any epsilon, this, I will have a series in epsilon that I can, uh, I'm keeping just the first order term in epsilon, which corresponds, in fact, to the assumption that epsilon is uh, small. So, both cases, both for uh, uh, BFP and uh, EFP, I have a form of this type. So, the same uh, conservation, hyperbolic conservation law, if you want, written before plus equal to some epsilon, of course, which is on the right -hand side, and uh, a term of this form. So that is, this is the first order correction. And the main point is that I want to give some details on the form of the uh, diffusion matrix which appear here. This is actually a vector, so this is a column vector, and so this is an uh, n by n matrix if w has n components. So this is a matrix. 
And this matrix D, which will be in the first case uh, for Burgers, a two by two matrix, and for Euler, a three by three matrix, they have an explicit uh, expression that I will give you in the next. Okay, and this is, I'm just recalling here what I said. So the, uh, let me recall that the size, the dimension of W for Burgers is uh, two dimensional. So the matrix will be two by two. And for Euler, it will be three by three. Uh, three, by three. So these are the expressions that I promised. So let me set uh, alpha, which is m squared over r squared. So let me recall that n is the density of the carrier phase, and this is the total, then the, the hybrid density, what I call like that. Then here, there is a term connected with the pressure. So nt prime times rho, times the density of particles, divided by r squared. And gamma is rho over that. Actually, this gamma is not to be confused with the gamma of the gamma law. <laughs> Two different objects. Uh, so, for example, when I consider the case, the incompressible case, what I call the incompressible case, this expression simplifies because uh, um, n is equal to 1, so uh, alpha is equal to 1 over r squared, simply. Uh, then here there is a p prime, so since pn is constant, then this becomes essentially zero, and then this is exactly the same, rho over r. And these are the two forms for the viscosity, the correction, which uh, arise from uh, some uh, not uh, so easy, some, some computation essentially. Uh, these are the expression. So the first term in the case of Burgers, I have a two by two matrix. There is here an alpha, which is n squared over r squared. Actually, this is for Burgers, so it's one over r squared, but it's the same. Uh, gamma, which is rho over r squared, plus the other term, which is for less. And, uh, okay, in general, incidentally, let me also uh, say, say that this sum so is, uh, will be proved to be a, a parabolic system, essentially. It's really parabolic. The, the diffusion is present in both the first and second equation. So it's a, a, it's a full parabolic system. The second, in the second case, in fact, I have something different. So the, the matrix D, that's more uh, probably uh, precise, a precise description, maybe. Um, so here there is a block decomposition because you see the, the second line. It's the one relative to the variable r. It stays with zero on the right hand side. So this is all of them. Why the the first and the third they have no zero. Uh, they have no zero values. So this means that the system is not parabolic, but is um, hyperbolic parabolic. And there is this nice to the standard standard. Uh, block the composition for the uh, diffusion matrix. And again, the symbols are exactly the same that I used here. So alpha and beta are written over there. So you can recover uh, which are the specific expression. Let me also say this is something that will be important at the very end of the talk. Uh, that the regime that I'm going to observe after that, this is just the regime for epsilon small, so when the uh, mean free path is small, uh, but the regime that I, will, uh, I like to analyze in more detail is when studying and uh, uh, considering uh, shock profiles is the regime where theta is equal to zero. Well, you see a lot of the degeneration the generation up here in the play, because here you have this second equation in which the diffusion is zero, Zero here, but it's not a big problem. Here also, the, the composition is different because these two terms will be zero. This also will be zero, so you will have just some um, viscosity in the first term, and this two block is, is different. It's really it's definitely a different regime. From the one in which you formally uh, set theta equal to zero. But this is something that I would like to observe more details. Okay. 
after. Okay, uh, this is the first observation, uh, which is the following. Uh, the, um, the first two, the, the two models, they have a, an important difference as far as I see it with respect to the, the Galilean transformation. So assume that I just start moving with some speed to zero, uh, and I try to uh, see how the equation changes. So whenever I have something that is uh, uh, poorly transported with speed u, of course, then I have to change u with some new speed, which is, uh, uh, this should be, okay. Uh, so I, I change variable using this rule. So t uh, s go in t and epsilon is uh, uh, equal to x minus some speed uh, u zero. And then what you get is something like that. So you change the derivative with this definition here, and you see that you end up with exactly the same kind of form for two this two transport equation. So this is exactly it's why. This equation is invariant. This just this equation is invariant as the linear transformation. Why something different appears at the level of the second equation in the case of Bourbier's Fokker plan. So you remember that the first equation was something like, like that. So the, this is the hyperbolic Bourbier's Fokker plan. So you change, make the same change of variables here, and then you end up with something that has some additional term here, that is, which is u0. The epsilon b. So this means that the equation that I have to solve when I move with some speed u0 will be able in principle to recognize which is the speed. While the idea of the Galilean transformation is that we should have something that is actually some innovation is invariant with respect to Galilean transformation if you are not able to understand which is the speed of propagation with your speed of propagation. So you should not be able to understand to find out which is this this this, this is something that happens when the equation are exactly same. Here, in fact, it's different because this is something that is relative to the hyperbolic case of Burger's pocket plan. So here there is u0, and so this means that, in principle, you can understand u0 looking at the evolution of the equation. This is for the hyperbolic Burger's pocket plan. The same curves appears for the parabolic version. So there is no way of compensating in some sense this term appearing here in the hyperbolic part when considering also the, Z, the second order. So this is definitely like that. This means that the Burger socket plant, both hyperbolic, both parabolic, are not invariant by uh, under a Galilean transformation. This is that it's not the case for the other modeling, so the, the case of the Euler Fokker plant equation. In which both models, so the hyperbolic and the hyperbolic parabolic, after some computation, it should never, it's not it's so complicated, it can be shown that they are invariant under, under Galilean transformation. And we, this will have some interesting consequences uh, later on. This is just a sort of remark. Now, uh, what about the entropy for? Uh, the systems. Both modeling, so the Burger's Fokker Planck, the Euler Fokker Planck, has some uh, entry, possess some entry, which can, in both cases, can be formally derived by the form, the expression for the entropy at the level of this kinetic fluid modeling. So let me concentrate to start with the, to the case of Burger Fokker Planck. Uh, so in the first case, uh, I have here, the, the, this is the, the, the formal uh, um, expression for, uh, for the entropy at the kinetic level. So there is a part relative to the particle, which as we said is one half u squared because the density is considered equal to one. And there is a part, a separated part that is just the part. Then you consider the same kind of limit that we uh, stated before. And uh, formally, at least, uh, but this can be proved that it's, this is actual entropy. I call the uh, H epsilon BFP converts to some function, which does not depend, of course, on epsilon, which is eta BFP, which has this form. 
And what is interesting here is the structure because you see there is some term that is again a term value just to the fluid, some term that just level to the particle, and then there is one term which is mixed is the part relative to the fluid and the part. So it's really the coupling term. And then there is some associated entropy. Okay, this is just computation. So uh, when I have an entropy, this can be the, the second order derivative of the entropy, which is uh, in this case a metric, a two by two matrix, is uh, uh, usually, uh, it is, and uh, we proved in general, it is a symmetrizer for the system. So this is a symmetric matrix, uh, which is uh, uh, actually the entropy is also, can also be proved that it can be second order derivative that is. Uh, a convex function. So, and this is a, a symmetrizer for, for the system. Here, there are just some computation. I guess these are the computation that show that uh, the matrix uh, D squared eta uh, B is uh, a positive definite because the trace is positive and the determinant is also positive. As soon as theta is positive, and also these other coefficients, but all of, all of them. Uh, we are in a regime in which these are positive. Again, you see when theta goes to zero, so this degenerate. So this, the, the final moral is that d square eta d is positive definite, and so the system is parabolic. Then there is a second part, which is essentially in the same spirit, so it's for the Euler equation, so there is some minor modification taking into account the fact that there is a dependence from n, and again, you obtain a second term, which is a bit more complicated, but with a similar decomposition, with an intermediate term here, which is, uh, in fact, the interaction of the two parts of the carrier phase, the square phase, and uh, and, this. and this is uh, uh, an entropy. This is the action of the entropy, eta. Uh, of course, it's a three by three matrix, uh, and uh, the, 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 the final result is something like that. So, when you uh, compute uh, uh, d squared eta times p, is uh, as uh, the uh, desired problem. So here, of course, the difference is that in the first row here, we have zero. This is because I have a change, a change at the second and the first, but in case. So these are the, the new standard the usual uh, block decomposition that we know for, uh, for hyperbolic parabolic system. In particular, as soon as theta is positive, the Shizuta Kawashima condition, which is a technical condition uh, relative to the stability, more or less, is uh, satisfied for theta positive. So up to now, I would say that um, both systems have a main difference, which is respect to the Galilean invariance. Even if I have, I have not used that, so for some reason I would like to prefer the Euler socket plant description, but it's not, uh, not clear why. It's just uh, based on the fact that. The, the, the latter, the Euler Fokker Planck equation, has this additional property of being invariant of the Galilean transformation. Now, in the short time with the five minutes, I would like to tell you something about the traveling profiles. So, what are shock, uh, shock profiles? These are some special solutions with the form of a traveling wave and satisfying some asymptotic conditions. So, you may also imagine that it's just simply a smoother version as soon as the uh, W is smooth, uh, connecting to different states, which are called here W star and W. This is the equation that I obtain when I plug into the system this kind of ansatz. Uh, so, of course, there is a parameter that is unknown, which is the speed, and then essentially these are as the same meaning that I had before. This is exactly the point in which considering a model which is Galilean invariance like ESP is different with respect to the other case, because uh, I can decide to move with speed C and I have the same image. So, this means that for the second model, I can uh, delay essentially this term. While in the other case, if I change speed, 
this will change, this will affect the damage. So this is the point in which um, the situation. Yeah. Now, maybe if I would just file um, five minutes, um, I can skip this part. Maybe this can be considered just to recall some definitions. So see, we said that it is the speed of propagation. This is the symbol that I use for the jump from the asymptotic state, so W minus W star. And so, and there are essentially in our situation two kinds of regimes, small jumps <laughs> and large jumps. So essentially the point is that what concerns the small jumps, um, so the small amplitude of the shocks, uh, the situation is more or less the same because this kind of entropy condition that I'm not going to present, so if you know it, it's okay, otherwise it's not important. Uh, in any case, because of that, um, since this uh, the condition, this entropy condition is satisfied, one can prove for both models that um, small amplitude shock waves, so <laughs> the situation in which the asymptotic states, like here, are sufficiently small, this is this problem as a, uh, a solution. Actually, it has uh, okay. The, the solution is not unique because there is this uh, inv uh, invariance with respect to translation. So uh, this is always this is always the case. And so this is essentially, essentially a statement uh, saying that uh, the diffusion map, since uh, the new entropy condition. Is satisfied plus some other conditions, the rest will be verified on the matrix D, but they hold. So, uh, then for both models, so for both BFP and EFP, uh, for both models, there is existence. Now, maybe in three minutes, two minutes. Uh, so, I, I would like to discuss something shortly about the large and shock profile. So as far as I as far as I so as, since now I have told you essentially that I have some modeling, different type of models, and they both have small amplitude shock profiles, more or less. Now I want to explore what is the case with respect to large amplitude the shock profiles. And I'm going to concentrate on EFP model, essentially because I know that. It is the Galilean invariance, so I can assume without loss of generality that C is equal to C. So I'm considering this kind of model. And uh, as far as I know, when I consider large amplitude shock profiles, there are no general uh, results. So I have to understand in details uh, the specific model that I'm using. While locally, I can imagine that I may have some sort of uh, abstract uh, functionalizes theorem that can tell me if uh, uh, a solution of this uh, system exists or not. But here I have to work directly on the specific form of F and D and try to work on it. And so, and this is the type of equation that I'm considering. So this is just the translation for the case with the viscosity D of uh, this, uh, this function W. And this is the system that I get. Now, the interesting point is that uh, when theta goes to zero, let me give a bit more details. Uh, what's going to happen to this system when theta tends to zero? Uh, let's see, imagine that, in fact, that I am putting here all the theta in an explicit way. So all theta are uh, explicit. And so what's going to happen in the regime theta equal to zero? Well, then this second equation, which has some nice uh, <coughs> term here, minus theta gamma w star over r, this term is a, is a singular limit. So when theta goes to zero, tends to some sort of algebraic relation. So the formal limit of this system here is actually is a, a coupling between a differential equation, a single differential equation, which appears from the multiplication of beta times dm dy, together with a, an algebraic relation. Which is exactly what I wrote here. 
So this is exactly the same model in which I formally put the theta equal to zero. Now the point is that here I can manage a little bit on this uh, form and then I write to some sort of animational expression for the, for the system, if you want, which is the coupling of an ordinary differential equation with this function A that has some meaning essentially. Uh, it's not written here, but in any case, this is one over A minus one over B. Uh, so a first order equation together with the, uh, the constraint. Now, this is just for the last slide I'm going to present. For this kind of structure, in the limiting case theta equal to zero, it is possible to prove that the, the system that I wrote before has possessed some large amplitude profiles. So there exist traveling wave solutions, smooth profiles with given asymptotic states. So here you see there is a uh, the, the asymptotic state with the, with the star, and then there is the other asymptotic state with, before it was without the, the star. But uh, for uh, any uh, value of the pressure, essentially, this, this is relative to the pressure, then I can prove that it's possible to show that there exists uh, traveling profiles. Just uh, uh, just to understand uh, uh, that what does it happen in a simple case? So if I consider the gamma law with gamma equal two, so I consider here uh, gamma equal two, then this case star is two. So then QA function is more or less like the pressure function. The normalized pressure is, is squared. Uh, then I have. Uh, the existence of traveling profile actually in all of this region that, that is down here. So for any point here, I have uh, existence of traveling profiles. Why? 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 For k equal to? Is it how sharp is the box? Yes. Why? Yes. Why? Now the point is that here this picture wants to show that. So this is something where something where a, a situation in which I have always have this uh, right. profile because, was, because was, the asymptotic states are sorry? That was always less than one because it's same over out. Yes. So the case always have yes, and the point is that the first statement, this is the idea in this picture. I unfortunately I didn't have time to show, but essentially the, the idea is that. The, the situation for the small shock correspond to this gray line, while here this is for the limiting so temperature uh, zero. Then you have existence for also for large uh, perturbation. So in all of this region, then I have this kind of. This is again the picture for theta equal to zero. Then we can try imagine to perturb a little bit and try to get more or less a similar picture for small. T. So having a wider region where we have existence. I'm sorry to have taken too much time for this first part. So um, this is just a list of um, uh, some selected references. Um, actually, we are working with the polygon theory, uh, essentially on this kind of uh, result that I presented here, and. Uh, I thank you very much for your attention. Questions? In the audience, please. <coughs> Not in the audience. Uh, I, okay. I was hoping that someone else. Not a plant. I think it's an interesting question. I was wondering whether. Uh, it would be interesting to consider a different case like the zero or small value of theta, but uh, epsilon finite. So still remaining the kinetic level. Is there any interest in remaining at the kinetic level with the small or zero value of theta? Uh, this is a very good question. So the point is that when you want to try to work, to try to understand the, the 
uh, actually this is in some sense part of the project. So one of the, the, the starting idea was something like that. So trying to keep the kinetic description for the uh, part for the dispersed phase and try to understand what is the structure also for shock profiles at the level of this kinetic uh, fluid uh, description. Uh, actually, the point is that also at the level of just the genetic part, uh, the existence results are very limited, rather complicated. So uh, the point is that you uh, there are some results uh, just for the genetic part, eh, which are uh, you, for example, to question Schmeisser and uh, some other I cannot remember, and also some other paper by. I can't remember the name, but <laughs> uh, I will say later on. Uh, um, so the, the point is that my goals and uh, some collaborator, and uh, this, the description is much more complicated. So you have some existence result, for example, in the regime of small shots. So this is in principle it could be reachable, but it, with a much more complicated structure. So. Um, what is it possible? To, and actually, we have some sort of partial answer because we know that as soon as we keep the first order term in epsilon, then we have this kind of existence. So we may imagine to proceed with this expansion by truncating some orders and try to see if the same kind of results are possible. And now there are these results by table of the maybe for maybe something maybe for it has some nice description for what's going to happen. When you keep uh, even also higher order term in the expansion frames, so it's not limited to the second order like here, but it can go as far as you want. Uh, so this is a possibility. There are two possibilities, but it's uh, it's definitely an interesting point. And <laughs> you're welcome. More questions? One. <laughs> uh, okay, so we can thank again Coriano for the international. And we will soon in the final.
So uh, I think that we go to the second speaker session with uh, Adam Silla from the Thank you, Giuseppe. And thank you to uh, all the organizers for inviting me to this uh, nice, uh, nice event. I really appreciate it. So um, for those of you who don't know me, my name is Adam Silla. So I'm uh, Boris Andrena, former KD student. And usually, um, I'm doing more uh, traffic flow dynamics, macroscopic model for traffic flow uh, dynamics. But I, as you can see here, I'm going to talk to you about something different today, um, which is in very design for compact and non homogeneous conceptual loss. So you can see this stuff as a continuation, as a sequel to what Enrique uh, talks about uh, Wednesday. Uh, sorry, I forgot to mention this is uh, also joint work with uh, Ronaldo here and Vincent Perolas, who was my second advisor in the United States. So, he is going to, to turn out in three parts. So, in the, uh, first, in the first part, I'm going to talk to you about the battery, how I got to work on this model. Then, I'm going to tell you that uh, we're going to start from uh, directly to tackle inverse design issues we have to do some permanent work before. And then I'm going to talk about the subject in initial data and quantification. So uh, let's talk with the, with the part story. So um, it was, I believe, halfway to my PhD when uh, Vincent Perlas came to me and, and showed me this, this, uh, this model, I mean, this model and these questions. So he introduced, he introduced me to this, uh, universities and questions. So uh, we don't we all know entropy solution. We know that it, it was shocks. So that's a backward problem you'll post. So he came to me and uh, he told me, yeah, you know, with these equations, there are some questions that would be interesting, like, uh, can you reach any states? If you reach these states, is there any condition in each data so that you can reach the states? Can you give a characterization of uh, the states of admissible U0 or reachable W0? So I was thinking, yes, this is kind of a nice problem. This is uh, two questions. And um, as Enrique uh, mentioned earlier, there are lots of uh, applications to this question. And then, of course, he made me read this, uh, this two, these two articles. In fact, like this one, in which uh, with, with uh, Rinaldo, they answered all of these questions. And then he said to me, uh, this is nice, but uh, now we want to do an extension of this work with the text. So I was like, okay, so this looks like a lot of work, but so what, uh, what kind of X dependence to talk? Because there's no way we could tackle like the general X dependency. And at that time, I was mostly familiar with that kind of dependence for, for flux, you know, the LWL, classical LWL, with the function which tells you that the speed is dependent on the space. So I had that kind of space dependency in mind, okay? And then Vincent and also Renato, they told me, oh, yes, this is, this, this can be a nice talk because if you look at the function theta, the main property of the function theta that's uh, as of its compact, it does not depend on the uh, space anymore. So like, we thought that it would be a good idea to start with a spot function with a compactly, uh, uh, compactly in space uh, dependence. It's not a story, but I'm going to change the, the notations, but for all obvious reasons, for reasons that become uh, obvious. So now I'm calling H the flux, and I'm putting this X dependency here. And this is the, the framework with which we, uh, we work. So you see the x dependency here, compactly x dependency here, and we stayed in the framework of convex function with this assumption, which uh, which is telling that essentially uh, for all x, h has this uh, step. It's nice and we're going to use it. Yeah. So this is the, the kind of framework we settled, and some. 
we will simulate examples of such functions of the free cancel. So imagine that f is brothers, and then uh, you can add or multiply or compose by the choice of a function f to and theta. So this was interesting because it gave, it gave us a kind of wide uh, class of function h. And if you remember, there's no Lipschitz continuity assumption. So this one this was really important. Not to require that Lipschitz uh, continuity. Oops. So then with this with this framework, the the M was uh, as I told you before to answer the inverse sign question. So given and final states, can you reach it? Can you describe the initial data that, that travel you to these states? And uh, can you characterize the, the states that are reachable? But the problem was that so we could not uh, start here directly with uh, this question because there are there were a lot of questions like uh, simple questions like in some of well positive uh, situation is this equation well positive with this set of assumptions this was not so clear and then since we wanted to do an extension of the work and we had to know about the correspondence between this equation and the dynamic equation and um, all technical questions that were not so clear and had to be uh, had to be Clearly. So this is what this is why this second section exists. So uh, because I wanted to show you what we did before tackling this initial data application. Okay. So firstly, I wanted to show you this um, this query bounds. So it's not so much the results which I wanted to show you. But really, the, the tools that we used. So here you can see that uh, L appeared. So L is the dungeon, the, the genre transform of H with respect to uh, the second variable. So this is a nice estimator, <clears throat> I found really, really simple. And the tool that we used were uh, this one, especially the notion of general characteristics of that variables. So essentially, I'm not going to go into the details of uh, what are the generalized variables. But essentially, it's a way of, uh, even in the context of entropy solution, which are continuous, you can allow yourself to uh, use ODE to solve the key. And since you can use ODE, you have the function H, which is functions along the characteristics. So once you see this estimate, this nice estimate, you see that each is some way you can bound H, you can bound Q. So this, this is really the, the importance of the estimate. And then there is the this matter of the link between the Hamilton Jacobi equation and the conservative law. So again, I'm going to spread that, that uh, in our context, this was not so clear because we didn't have any ellipses continuity, and the aim was to, to get this correspondence with the same assumptions of on the function h. This is really important. You fix one set of assumptions for the function h, and then you derive all the classical properties that you know. So of course, this, this, uh, these results are not new. I mean, uh, everybody knows them. But really, the, the issue was to prove them. We couldn't, I mean, we could not find any references on uh, where it was done. So maybe it was done somewhere, but we didn't find it. So if you, if you know that it's done somewhere, please, please tell me. So really, I'm going to get your attention on this side of the, of the slide, in the rest of the method, to get Region bounds for the solution to the habit of the question this first term. So this was really the, the center of the of the group. Once you get that, can everything falls uh, falls last, but you have to, to get that. And this was not so so easy to get. Because once you get that, you get uniformly, I mean compact uniformly convergence for these frequencies. So it's okay. And once you have that, 
since you have the corresponding Bluetooth smooth solutions, you get that, and then you can apply a standard comes in contact as fast as you need. Okay, so all of this to say that. Uh, even in our framework with uh, X dependency, the first thing is these two equations still hold, still holds, but there is a there is a lot of work to do to do that. And then we added another correspondence was between the solution to the Hamiltonian equation and this uh, problem of calculus of variations. So this one, this one was, was kind of divided in the, in the literature, so this one was okay. The real, the real issue was, uh, was rather this one. Okay. So here you can see that I'm introducing the subsets R. So maybe it's a little complicated or not, but essentially just the, uh, the Hamilton rays, I mean the solution, the, uh, Method of characteristics. This is what our for. So as you can see, this was the, the preliminary work to tackle the inverse design issue. But as you might have noticed, we really have more information on the solution to the Hamilton equation than we have on the solution to the conservation. In particular, in the case where you don't have any X dependency, you, you have the whole class formula. But here, you add the, the X dependency, you don't have that in the solution. However, for the solution to the Hamilton jack the equation, you still have, so you still have that characterization. So this is the equivalence of the lax hope formula. So we still have that even in the X dependency case. So this is why instead of attacking the input sense of the solution to the conservation law, we did it for the Hamilton equations. But since we have a correspondence as a matter on which one we have. So this bring this brings me to the, the third part. So I'm just recalling the, the the problem here, and I'm introducing some notations also. So you have the solution to the Hamilton Jacobi equation. You fix the final states, and then the question is the following In which condition of W is this subset non empty? Once this subset is non empty, can you characterize the, the user that belongs that belong to the subset? And then can you say something about the structure of this uh, subset? So, these three questions, this is the solid. Three questions that we uh, that we answer in this text in this case. And of course, I'm going to repeat myself, but all of these questions were answered in this paper with uh, uh, and Olaf. Okay, so first uh, for the first question, given the final state that will you we want to know in, uh, under what conditions of that W can you ensure that this subset is non empty? So, the subset is the subset of initial data that bring you to that W at empty. Okay. So, to do that, we started from this expression. So, this is the solution to the Hamilton Jacobi equation given by this calculus of variations expression in the the thing is, if you have that value here, what would be u zero? Actually, this this was the equation. So we simply kind of inverse this relation and introduce this u zero star. This is really coming from here, and the theorem that we're about to, to prove is that this subset is non-empty if and only if this use your star is in the subset. So this sub, so, so this function here is really important in the sense that you just have to check that if this initial data brings you to uh, the final set that we mentioned earlier. So this is what uh, was written behind this theorem. 
So I'm, I'm not really going to dive into the details of proofs, but um, it's it essentially relies on the generalized characteristics and uh, this expression of the of the solution to present the question. So this was really nice because uh, this is a, this is a, an answer to the first question. And then uh, more complicated. Once you know that the subset is non empty, can you give the characterization of the data that belong to this subset? And again, we were able to, uh, to, to keep the following problem with the following theorem. So, for a initial data user to belong to the subset, it has to verify these two condition, conditions. So, first, it has to be bigger than your zero star. And it has to be exactly the same as zero star on some subsets, uh, adherence of PWR. So the function PW here is giving you the value of the characteristics starting from x equal to zero at some at, at some zero. So this is what we do. So we start from x due to the, the characteristics and PW here. And PW is the value of, uh, of the characteristics at zero. So this was the last characterization of the belonging or not of the other function. And then finally, um, the result on the structure of uh, this subset, it's a convex cone and it's at an intersection of zero star. So for those of you who know about represent these three results are the same as uh, the one in the x dependent theory. So when there is no x dependence, you have these three results about uh, the characterization of these subsets, of the belonging of the subsets and the structure of, uh, of the subsets. So this was a um, this was satisfying in the sense that we recovered the same result uh, in the no, no space dependence. But, uh, however, I'm, I'm not going to tell you that uh, in the X dependency, everything is smooth and, um, and happens really, really nicely. For example, consider this Hamiltonian. So you see, I'm taking burgers and I'm just adding a G of X and G of this. Uh, this jet. So you see, G doesn't depend on X uh, outside the certain complex and it gives you this, uh, this Hamiltonian. And I'd like to show you what's happening to uh, this initial data, this Hamiltonian, as uh, time passes. Okay. Okay, so nothing's happening. Okay, so okay, so this is not really satisfying, but uh, I don't know if you can tell the difference between the two curves. So um, one is supposed to be red and the other blue. I mean, the nice one is the one when you don't add any x dependency. Okay, so you recognize this uh, rarefaction profile as usual. And the other one it was supposed to show you what happened uh, in the X dependency. So the main thing you have to, to get from this one is that starting from a rare reflection profile, actually the solution evolved into a shock. This was really surprising to me. It still, it, it still is. And this was to show you that um, just by adding a small, real small uh, X dependency and real small, uh, really simple, by the way, you obtain some chaotic situations, some chaotic scenarios. <clears throat> okay, so I'm um, it's important, so sorry, sorry about that. And uh, of course, I, I mentioned a lot of uh, characteristics. Uh, we all know that in the 
and there is no x dependence in the characteristic of stress signs. This is not the case, obviously, in the x dependence uh, scenario. When you see here what's happening, you have a lot of characteristics that, uh, that cross long before the uh, long, I mean, just after the final time. So this, this is also really surprising. And also one final comments. In this case here, when wanted to connect this point here to one point here, just have one, one possibility. But here, this is not so so clear anymore. But the shooting function is not uh, is not objective anymore. Okay, so what's uh, What's to, to, um, to recall from, from this talk? So first, in, um, in a certain class of compactly space dependent on convex Hamiltonian, we were able to recover some classical results on well possessedness and the correspondence between these two equations. And uh, we were able, also able to, um, to give an extension of the results of Colombo and Perolas in the case of no space dependency regarding the inverse descent question. So now for possible extensions, but there is hope for the multi-D uh, Hamilton Jacobi equations because, because in this case you still have the uh, the expression of the solution with the uh, calculus of variation formula. So you still have that. And this was the key in the proof of the all the inverse descent population that we did. However, well, for the multi-D controversial, we don't have any more the correspondence, and we, it's not so clear if we have access to uh, general characteristics and, uh, and anything. And finally, uh, so the assumption that um, the space dependency is kind of, of strong to ask for the derivative to be, to be null. Out of the certain compacts, so maybe we could do something by adding such a limit as, as exposed to infinity. And we could realize the convexity of some assumption. And the importance is that H uh, grows su sufficiently uh, fast. So we would want an equivalent to this, um, this estimate without the convexity. Okay, so that's uh, brings me to the end of the talk. Questions? Thank you very much for the talk. Uh, I was uh, coming back to this last uh, point here in this slide. The relaxing of convexity assumption. Uh, can you say something more about this case? Because this is a, I mean, just characteristic as a tool works very well when you have some convex flux. Mm -hmm. When you have some non convex flux, for example, the back regular function, uh, with the, the still you can extend the limit of generalized characteristics, but with some, uh, there are some problems because uh, some. Uh, some uh, Characteristic may exit from shock, something like that. But remember, I know that there is some sort of expansion. So I wonder which is the situation for in the case of black together, for example, for so just single points in which you change the convexity. And I, it's not clear to me if this final uh, relaxation that you are uh, requiring there, so this H uh, X U's with the blah blah blah, yeah. is this satisfied with it for? Uh, but the layer, it's not clear. I cannot remember exactly what it is. L, uh, it's uh, something that was before. I don't know. I, I, something more about the, the point of convex. Also, maybe one more question is yes. what about the result without the x dependence? Is there any result for non convex fluxes yes. or, or, or they really are based on the fact that you are a convex flux? Okay. Thanks. So, for your first question, um, you're right. The convexity is absolutely essential to deal with generalized characteristics. Um, and it's, I mean, it, it, it was shocking to me how how the convexity and the generalized characteristics were real tool to get uh, to get bounds. 
And so my point is that um, if you remove the complexity, there is some hope yet to get uh, an intrinsic bound, but I'm pretty sure that we won't, we won't use the um, characteristics. So um, I know that uh, Vincent Berla has started to do some computations without the complexity, and he seems to have what looks like to be uh, proof um, to prove that uh, you still have some kind of bounds, but without the you know, characteristics. And for your second question, uh, to my knowledge, um, I don't think that's uh, for a real complex, I mean, non convex, but without spade in the sense that we have a pure result on that. And I'm pretty sure that there are some counter examples out there that, uh, that prove you, for example, that the subject is not convex, for instance. Um, so I don't think that, uh, why are we mistaken? I'm pretty sure that you don't have such a such result yet. More questions? Yeah. Just, just a little bit, I fully confirm all what you said. Only fully. Only one addition that thanks to this effort and the last effort, it seems we are able to avoid complexity, but we need some sort of, as you said, coercitivity. The method being completely different. That's a level of complexity for But for example, the back level at the bounce remembers the back level. This is just one simple point which the fact we don't care about how many we do not request and we call C, call C. So it's a problem in the behavior of each. Yeah, if you want that H behaves more or less like a provides the bound similar to that as are provided by a norm. Okay. For large values. This is yeah. but we don't use that. More questions for comments? Okay, so we can thank Alvin for the show.